This Choircast podcast episode is brought to you by the Deadly Faith Podcast. Hey, heathens, I'm Lacey. And I'm Lola. And if you're deconstructing your faith and love true crime, then you need to subscribe to our show. On this podcast, we explore the world where religion and crime collide. We venture deep into cults, serial killers, and much more. Now, this world isn't full of sunshine and rainbows, but it's a world that needs to be explored. We're excited to bring truth to light. So get ready for some deep dives and some funny commentary as we tell these religious true crime tales. The Deadly Faith Podcast is available wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, here we are. No fanfare to open up tonight. No crazy stuff. We just uh, are going to talk. Yeah, I, uh, I've been thinking about this show all day. I've been thinking about a lot of stuff all day. And... Um, First of all, like kind of grateful, like thinking to myself, like, but at least tonight I can, you know, have some conversation time with Paul, with our guest, who's amazing, you know, feel connected to other people. And just, it's just an outlet. And Paul, I don't know if you remember, but you and I started podcasting together during COVID as a like, like how in the world are we to process the world? Um, and the conversation that's just you and me in our living room gets like a little, you know, like we wanted other people to be in on this and, uh, that's where we started. And then here we are again. And I feel like, um, I feel like this is all we know to do is just like be here tonight, talking to each other and learning from each other. And so, um, the thought of a peppy little opening was making my stomach twist more knots than it already was. So, yeah, yeah, it is a, I hear you not not a happy night so here we are um and uh so yeah maybe our hope is that this will be cathartic and so if you're joining us and we see art and bryce yokum is here bryce and aaron are with us two of our friends from visalia which is just south of here and peggy you know we really want to hear what you guys are processing. And it's been a day. Uh, I did a video, kind of just a a stream of consciousness today of some people I saw online and and well-intentioned, good-hearted were like, hey, it's going to be okay. You know, it's all going to be good and we're going to be okay. And and I was just like, I'm not there yet, guys. I, I, there, you can't tell me it's going to be okay. I, yeah. I'm not sure it's going to be okay. And I need I need some time to be angry and scared and to cry. And, and so that's where I still am. And I want to give people room. Like we, we don't have to be buck up little trooper tonight. Uh, I do believe there will come a moment where I will be ready to stand and say, okay, now I'm a part of the resistance and I'm going to lock arms with my uh, siblings and uh, my my uh, siblings of the world, and we're going to stand and protect each other as we ha- as we need to. Uh, but today, I think, is a day for me of lament and mourning, and and I'm a little bit afraid. I'm not ashamed to say, maybe in a way I've never been before in my life. I've had some people invalidate me for that, and. Uh, but this is the process we're in right now. And uh, so I do want to give people space to feel your feels, which uh, (laughs) some of our people on the right, our Christian friends would say, no, you know, all things work together for good. It's going to be fine. You, you crying libs, but uh, I think we, we just need to process together tonight. So um, we're going to get right into our, discussion with our very, very special guest. I like I've I've on the other side of the interview, we're we're I think we gotta just unpack like how how have you been thinking about it? I definitely have thoughts. I started off the morning here. I was like, I don't know what to do. So anyway, we'll get to all that. But um mostly we want to jump right into a conversation with a person that I know um is going to add so much to what we're all thinking about tonight because we get to read his articles, we get to read his books and um, just know that he's got a lot to bring to the conversation. And he is the one and only Jim Fallows. So we'll bring him in from the green room. And Jim, before we um, before we jump in, let me just get everybody who may be meeting you for the first time. Let me give them a little bit of background. Uh, James Fallows, we call him Jim, is a longtime book and magazine writer. The most recent of his 12 books is Our Towns. 
And this is how Jim and I first met because as Jim and his wife, Deb, were flying around the country um, in their little airplane, <laughs> meeting people on the ground, doing community building work in so many towns across America. That's how we encountered one another in Fresno. Bestseller. It's an amazing book, national bestseller, the basis of a 2021 HBO documentary. His works have won the National Magazine Award and the American Book Award. He grew up in Redlands, California, quite a bit south from here, but very similar to our hometown of Fresno. Is, is Studied... that the, that's the Fresno of Riverside County, I think, isn't it? <laughs> San Bernardino County, please. San Bernardino. Oh, <laughs> oh there you sorry go. about that. Not, not uh, that I'm sensitive about this. The biggest county in the world, bigger than like four East Coast states put together. It is, it is ginormous. It is ginormous. Um, studied American history at Harvard, economics at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He's reported from around the United States for more than a decade. Uh, Jim was in China, Japan, Southeast Asia. He also worked as an editor of U.S. News and World Report magazine on a program design team at Microsoft. And while in his 20s, I love this part, a chief White House speechwriter for Jimmy Carter. He now writes Breaking the News on Substack and has a new article about California's promising future in Wired magazine, which is great. Everyone can check it out. We'll put it in the show notes. Um, and then today, Jim, you also had another wonderful piece uh, that you published on Substack that's just like the kind of moment. So, Jim, lay it on I, us. Like I, how hearing, hearing that bio, I feel unqualified to have you on the podcast. <laughs> So actually, Paul, it's wonderful to see you uh, digitally this way, virtually, after seeing you in person in Fresno many times. And thanks for all of your guidance there. Um, my wife, Deb, and I um, really enjoyed being Fresno in Fresno many times and telling your story. And so thanks for giving me this chance to join you. And it's a uh, 12, uh, 24 hours ago at this time, uh, we were with a number of friends in D.C. as a friend from Pennsylvania was starting to say, she's not getting enough votes out of Lackawanna County. She's not getting enough votes out of Philadelphia County, et cetera. So that was the beginning and it's been a consequential last 24 hours, last 12 hours. So um, I can tell you either my thoughts or either the heart or the brain part. <laughs> let's, let's you, you choose. What do you feel? Yeah, that's with? right. More, we want to hear both. Let you, right you pick where you want to start. So I'll, I'll start with the brain part. Um, the reason I think this election is more consequential than eight years ago when Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton the first time, is that there are so many ways you could argue the first time was a fluke. For example, I am sure, I'd bet any amount of money, even against Elon Musk, that if James Comey had not intervened 11 days before the previous yeah. election, that Hillary Clinton would have won. Um, that if there hadn't been this obsession with emails back then, you, you've seen the graphics of a word cloud of a coverage of Hillary Clinton eight years ago was 90% emails and coverage of Trump was border and all, all the, the rest. So there are all sorts of things that made it seem like a, you know, just a bunch of dominoes that happened to be lined up in the same way that all fell. This time, everybody knows who Donald Trump is. Everybody knows what he stands for. There, that his his campaign in the last two weeks, you know, having once worked in a presidential campaign, was as poorly run as any campaign has ever been. He was insulting women. He was insulting every kind of minority group. He was uh, decompensating on 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 the stage, and still people voted for him. And apparently, a majority of American voters have voted for him, which is only the second time in the last 32 years that a Republican candidate has won a majority. So this is tells us something about our country that I would na rather not have known, that people knowingly brought him back to power. So th that is the analytical part of this that I was talking about in this piece today, which um, I think gives us all reason to reflect. And can I say one more brain thing? Of course. <laughs> Which was, so I quoted about 10 days ago, I quoted two really venerable and, and hugely experienced um, uh, campaign consultant, Stuart Stevens, who worked for Mitt Romney and the, uh, the second George Bush and many other uh, people, John McCain, I believe he worked for, and James Carville, known to everyone from his uh, Bill Clinton time and, and onward. Each of them said, James Carville wrote an actual op-ed in the New York Times whose title was, Why I Am Certain 
that Kamala Harris will win. And Stuart Stevens had a long post whose theme was similar, which was Democrats, uh, you know, stop, um, stop your, your nervousness. I can tell you uh, she's going to win. And the argument both of them used was that America is a better country than this, that in the end, people would not vote for somebody who had been a convicted, you know, criminal and who had talked about his opponents the way he did. And they were wrong. And I was wrong to think that they were right. There was still this reservoir. And so we have to take seriously that 51% of those who turned out decided this was the way to go. So I'm hearing from people today like, oh, no, it, it was the economy. You know, James, James Carville's face, it's the economy, mm -hmm. stupid. Can we dismiss that this is a hard issue with the country and it's just a, a, a pocketbook vote? So, so, yes, comma, but blah, 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 which which is that the economy, quote unquote, was what people talked about. Um, but if you looked at any of the you know, the boring actual numbers. This is the strongest economy an incumbent party has ever run on. You know, when I was working for Jimmy Carter long ago, I left by the time he was having his re-election run against Ronald Reagan in 1980. But then the inflation rate was 20 percent. And it was just, you know, it was ruinous. There was a stagflation economy. And, and to have the job growth that the administration that that's, we've had for the last um, four years to have uh, asset values rising. You know, not the stock market is not the economy, but the stock market has been up. Gas prices are going down, et cetera, et cetera. And so there has been a combination of inflation as a real problem over the last uh, two or three years, you know, getting better than the last six months and a perception of the economy that has been one way or another through um, through so through whatever are the sources of disinformation have made people feel that this is a terrible economy, whereas by any actual measure, it is the best one any incumbent has ever run on, or at least since uh, since Franklin Roosevelt's time, you know, it's, it's since time preceding him. So yes, it is a pocketbook vote, but that says something strange too about our perception of the world that uh, this should be an economic crisis. Um, but But obviously that's what most people say. Yeah. Well, and I think like there's just the the reality that there are some key goods that people are purchasing that are still very expensive and purchasing power is like just not there. And so, you know, th like that in the middle of the nastiest, you know, year and years and years and years now of misinformation, disinformation, the way in which our worst enemies can penetrate our thinking and our consciousness all the time. So like we're in this like shit tornado, right? And, and <laughs> that's like, the technical term, right? <laughs> like It's nothing but shit flying around. I'll use it, I'll switch it. It's like, we're in a shit shower and then we open our mouths, you know, like, um, and, and people, so obviously people are not hearing the rational truth of the, the fact base, et cetera. Um, what I was hearing a lot of today was like, you know, it's not going to be that bad. Like, come on, you know, get over it. It's not going to be that bad. You know, he, he's not really going to do that stuff. And I, you know, like, like kind of the pocketbook voter who could rationalize away um, all of the principled arguments around like democratic processes and values and la, 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 la. Say, say a little something about like how, like, because I'm wrestling with yes. I feel like those people are trying to bridge and say like, Hey, I'm not, I'm not co-signing on all this stuff, but then I have to conclude. So either, either, either you don't think it's possible or it's like, you don't, I, I don't know. It's just a weird thing to um, kind of take that in, I'd say. So let me give you uh, an answer in the form of a question, if I could, as a, which is to ask you about something actually you would know about directly. And then, then I'll come into this. It's not going to be that bad. So something I have been reflecting on in the past, you know, 12 hours or so is whether there was much more anti-woman in power misogyny than I had allowed for. I had thought Hillary Clinton had sort of been the break, you know, the icebreaker there. Kamala Harris had been around as a vice president. I, I thought that that was accounted for, but there must have been more of that than I was thinking. 
as a successful woman politician, what say you? A thousand percent. A thousand percent, especially with the, you know, the the takeaway that Latino males were like the big difference maker, you know, like, um, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm just thinking of this deep, deep cultural bias that, I mean, it's pretty real. Like I, we, we're a majority Latino community in Fresno and like, you know, you can look around and like, oh yeah, that's a real thing. Da, da. But there are different forces that kind of moderate and mitigate for that. Um, but just imagining Latino males in all of these like blue cow, blue collar counties and swing states, et cetera, um, breaking for Trump and black men not, but Latino males. Um, I, I, I think that's what you have to conclude. And um, there, I mean, there's a big difference too about a white woman versus a woman of color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I was getting from a lot of people, the, she's a hoe thing and i was like wait he 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 was having an affair with a porn star and 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 it's it, it, there is i think a a man who has sex is virile and powerful and a woman who have se has sex is a is a slut and a gold digger and even i i had comments that really some borderline some not so borderline that we we want a man to go get what he wants, you know. That that's we need yeah. more men like that in the world, and and I do think that is a disgusting thing that has really seeped its way in into our culture in sort of this anti woke backlash. So just to follow on that for a second, and then I, I will answer uh, try to to answer your question. So the three of us are white for those of us, uh, for those not able to see <laughs> on, on the, the, the screen, um, how would the two of you as white people and me as a white person to assess the relative drag on Kamala Harris from being a woman versus being black and Indian? How, how do you think the two of those, you know, neither, um, what, what do you think? Which was more important or we just don't know? I mean, I, I think like it's, it's equal parts of both. So if, so being a white woman, let's say it's 50% harder than, you know, and being a woman of color, it's a hundred percent harder. So, um, I don't know. I, I mean, I have women of color in my office today that were crying because yeah. you know, we've heard it. And I know Paul, you were posting this on your stuff too. Like, one of them, young woman in grad school, going to USC, super bright, talented, up and coming, worked in government, now doing great communications work. And what is she, you know, she's like, okay, what I just heard was no matter what I do, I'm going to finish my graduate degree from USC, no matter what I do, I will, I will never, in this environment, I won't, I won't be good enough. And yeah. like, it's just like, that's the only way we can understand how that's hitting people. If Jesus were in America today, what would he say about the right-wing evangelical church? Pastor Paul's new novel, Religious Right, Religiously Wrong, a modern-day parable, answers this question in a riveting story of a mysterious miracle-working stranger who upsets a conservative evangelical town with his critique of their political views. Will the pastor and people of the local megachurch listen? Or will the church crucify the messenger all over again? Religious Right, Religiously Wrong is the story America needs right now. James Fallows, writer for The Atlantic and former speechwriter for President Jimmy Carter says Paul's book is very much worth reading and could not be more timely. Wayne Jacobson, co-author of the mega bestseller, The Shack, says this novel will confront fears and challenge the reader to a more excellent way of living and loving. Religious Right, Religiously Wrong, a modern day parable is available on Amazon or at our website, evangelicalish.com. Yeah, I, I saw uh, an African American woman post today. She said, Okay, we hear you loud and clear. The worst white man <laughs> is better than the best yeah. woman of color. That's the message we're all hearing loud and clear today. And, and um, you know, Barack Obama said, I'm it's my fault in 2016. He said, Donald Trump is president because of me. 
I became the first black president probably 10 years too early. The country was not ready for a black president. So I heard a lot of she's a woman. I think we're still okay with saying, I don't want a woman to be president. I don't know that we say, I don't want a black person to be That's president. It. That's it. Out loud quite as much, yeah. but I it's think like a cover it is up. still yeah. very yeah. much there. The misogyny um, is yeah. a cover up for the racism. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I mean, that, yeah. that J.D. Vance, you know, like, I think Trump could not have picked a woman to be his running mate. He, mm. he had to pick a white man. Um, it just, it, we're still there. It's, it's really crazy. So on the, to go from a, <laughs> a depressing theme to down towards the depths um, on, on the, is it going to be okay? So I, I, I will, it will be, will it be that bad? Um, I'll give you first the the positive spin, and then what I actually think. Um, well, I guess both of them are what I actually think, but but the second is is what I think more at the moment. The positive spin is that something that Barack Obama always said, and Jimmy Carter, who I worked for, said too, and you know Abraham Lincoln said, et cetera, is that keeping a democracy and society going that is a struggle that is never over that it is every single day. Um, if it's going to exist, it has to be fought for and contested. And that is the challenge in the different ways we all can believe and take on for the months ahead, the years ahead, and, and, and forever. So this is the battle that goes on eternally. And it is a, a very significant setback in, in that battle. The is it going to be? Is it going to be that bad? Um, I will tell you all and then people on on the, the the show now something I haven't said to anybody else and haven't written. Um, I am of the dreaded Boomer era. You know, I was in college during 1968 when things were going to hell during the Vietnam War. This is the worst thing America has done to itself in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. It is the worst thing because it's done knowingly. It's not the sort of uh, the luck of, of eight, eight years ago. And because the team around Trump knows what it's doing this time, as they didn't the last time. I think Trump himself, I believe he is falling apart mentally before our eyes, which means sooner or later we're going to have J.D. Vance. Um, but so Trump himself is a creature of impulse. Uh, it's, it's um, you know, we, we know what he's like, but the people around him, now know what they are doing. If Stephen Miller, he's had these eight years to fester with his um, racist anti-immigrant uh, plans. Um, people doing foreign policy, they know that it's time to abandon Ukraine and how to do it. And they know how to destroy NATO and how to do it. And the people in the environmental world know how to work at odds with what states like California are doing. Um, my sister, Sue, who is the um, a big shot in the environmental world, she's the head of resources for the future. She's done a lot of U.S.-China environmental work. Uh, she says this is, you know, a setback she will not live to see corrected. And so I think that the fact that they know what they're doing now means that the first point about the continued struggle is right. more important than before. So let's... Oh, I'm sorry, actually, I was just going to... Do you think... I mean, is the First Amendment in trouble? Do you, do you think we will see the, I don't know, maybe not the dissolution of the First Amendment, but so the dissolution um, of it? In my hierarchy of things to worry about, that's sort of not in the in the, in the, in the top radar zone. Um, well, it's, though, it, it is practically you know, Trump, journalists yeah. being arrested, you know, yes. you with you yes. know, reporters being arrested. You know. So, you know, Trump has talked about, you know, CBS needs to be shut down because of his complaint with 60 Minutes. And, and, and I may be having a failure of tragic imagination. I don't, um, you know, I, I don't, I have fewer fears in that zone than I do of being swamped by misinformation, by the tsunami of shit, as Ashley is saying, yeah. which yeah. Elon Musk, you know, is is yeah. presiding over now. And so, um, I think that that it will be uh, what's going to happen to to the immigrant population, which is the soul of America, is something to watch for. Having 
the next, both Clarence Thomas and Alito are likely to resign the next year or two, and there'll be Eileen Cannon will be there or Stephen Miller himself or other people. So uh, the judiciary is, so has the control of the House, <coughs> has control of the House been called yet? I, I don't I, know. I heard today we won't know until it'll, it'll take a week or two for California to finish up its counting <coughs> and, and we won't know control until California is finished. That will be very important about yes. whether there is any break in the system and, and the other break. So I think all of us, it's the next stage is thinking of what are the the the, the breaks that um, to yep. day by day. That's what I was going to ask you about. So I was imagining today, um, just imagining the, you know, sort of the fallout, the, the, you know, the Stephen Miller, Steve Bannon, the, all of this. And um, I'm just imagining, do you think it's possible that somewhere from the most like unexpected reaches of, you know, the the Republican right in Congress. Do you think there's any possibility that members of Congress, Republican members of Congress would have any sort of a voice or a backbone when it comes to like really fundamental American institutions and democratic principles? Do you think there's a point where they'd be like, Mike Rogers might be like, yeah, you know what? That's just a little too far. Mike Johnson, We're just not, mean, sorry, Mike Johnson. Yeah. We're just yeah. not going to mm -hmm. do that. Do you think that's possible? So uh, anything is possible. <laughs> I, I don't know where we've seen it before. Yeah. I mean. and, and, and a sobering example to me is the most, the most influential person in the last half century in U S politics. Um, even more than Donald Trump is Mitch McConnell, right? In my view, and he had the chance after January sixth to take yeah. Donald Trump entirely out. This is out all running. Mitch's fault. All it, Mitch's it, fault, in, indeed. And there, there are seven Republican senators who were all of them about to retire, et cetera, who were willing to to impeach Trump uh, and convict him the second time. Which would, if he'd been convicted, then he would have been out of politics. But they couldn't get you know more Republicans, and and so I think my impression is that the Republican Party. If Trump had lost, they would all be saying now, like Nikki Haley, oh, finally, you know, we can move forward, et cetera, et cetera, and be competing to be the next one. But now he seems even stronger with them. So anything is possible. Um, keep hope alive, et cetera. And we'll yeah. see what can be done to make that seem attractive to, yep. to somebody. Yep. I, I mean, that's all we uh, got, right? It's like yeah. the guardrails are gone. We, it, it, yeah. we, it's all we have that that individual people would be able to like access, like be like, no, no, like that's actually a, a step too far for me. We are not going to throw away the democracy, you know? Well, and, and I think not only are, you know, the guardrails in the, in the white house gone, the, the Supreme court guardrails are gone. And, you know, a Steve Bannon type is, is going to be there to say, well, what if we just say, you know, even if the Supreme Court rules against Trump, yeah. what if we just say, we don't care what you say, Supreme Court? What what army do you have to yes. stop us? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so here is a little ray of sunshine, if you will. Okay. All right. So it's so if the two most right-wing members of the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito, are the ones most likely to peel off. They're the two oldest ones. Um, Thomas, you know, he can be you know, the, the Crow family of Texas can make it worth his while, et cetera. I think he's the most corrupt person to have been on the Supreme Court, at least since the Gilded Age, et cetera. They're the two oldest, most likely to leave, and they're also the most, most right wing. So if they are replaced, it's not necessarily a net change. And there are people I know who study the court who say they're actually, they're place, placing their hopes on Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. Mm -hmm. imagining that two of them might want to be mm. seen as something other than, than uh, part of the Dred Scott court. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so that, that maybe we can hope for. Yeah. <laughs> Brett that. Kavanaugh and well, well, and I, okay. So in Moss, Moss Motor, our friend uh, here from Fresno was asking help. Is there anything we can hope for? I mean, honestly, the midterms are not that far away, right? Like, like a, a break in the action could be, um, one how you know, we got to get one chamber back. Um, yes, and that, and that is what, what to work. And California is very significant in that, among other ways. Yes, from the House seat. Sorry, I interrupted, Ashley. No, that's okay. But, but 
like people are right now like raising money for midterm. You know, it, it is it is on for two years from now. And um, that that really could be a break, you know, like a very burned out emergency handbrake. Yeah. And they were saying last night that that uh, the map really does benefit the Democrats in the Senate in two yes. years. Uh, that, that That is is true. And you can think back. So Obama, most of what he had to get done, he had to get, in, get done in his first two years because the 2010 midterms were the the dawn of the Tea Party, et cetera, et cetera. And so he, and that was a, a huge loss. And Bill Clinton, similarly, that he, although he recovered in his second term, his first term essentially ended with the first um, first midterms. And so, yes, it is worth concentrating on the midterms. It is worth um, uh, invoking whatever uh, supernatural intervention we can to see that how <laughs> control the House is going to go when the, the, the count is, is finished. So um, local trying to foster local resistance, local institutions, the midterms and everything else. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, my fear is, uh, I mean, there's many, but Trump benefited from an economy that was already starting to roar when he came in and he got credit for this great economy. <laughs> And I think that I think that's going to happen again. I already, like you said, the, the economy's good. And so now he's going to come in. He's got the media ecosystem on the right. That's then going to tout, look at the Trump economy, look at the Trump economy. So I, I, I am a little worried whether uh, the midterms are going to, you know, go the, the Dems way or not, you know. Uh, and I, you know, that is, um, we, we can't know. On economics, I will rec uh, recommend an article uh, that came out in the past week in The New Yorker uh, by a longtime you know, friend of mine from college years onwards named Nicholas Lemon, spelled L-E-M-A-N-N. -N. He's a former dean of the Columbia Journalism School, now a writer for The New Yorker. And essentially, it's the news nobody has heard about the way that the combination that by dynamics, the infrastructure investment is the biggest thing since at least the New Deal. And that that this will be, you know, playing out or not just over the next year or two before the midterms, but for for a very long time and how much Biden resents the fact that this, you know, that they've done all this and, and getting no credit. But it's very much worth reading about sort of the real economic landscape we're yeah. we're dealing with. So I endorse that all. And it's not paywalled. You you were the head uh, uh, speech writer. So, um, I think we lost. I read Jim, his... did you? Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so, I, I, I heard um, Paul, you got cut off after speechwriter. Could you uh, oh. redo that again, please? Can you hear me now? I can yeah. hear you now. Yes. Okay. Um, you, you were the head speechwriter for the Jimmy Carter team. Um, I read Stuart Stevens' book, It Was All a Lie. He talked about how the Republicans decided to go after the racist South in the early 70s. We know then around Carter. Uh, came the moral majority and like, we're going to weaponize abortion to because we're pissed at Carter uh, for the uh, uh, Jerry Falwell, Liberty University, Bob Jones University. I, I, tell us a little bit about that. I know you said you stepped out before that that campaign, but before did the you guys see yes. this this yeah. weaponization of, of abortion and Christianity coming against Jimmy Carter, who is a Christian, yes. you know? And I saw it coming at a specific moment in time. So I started working for Carter in sort of the uh, the, the spring of um, late spring of, of 1976. Uh, I was unemployed. My wife was in graduate school. I needed a job. $500 a month sounded good. So I joined, <laughs> joined the, the, the campaign team, then stayed on for a couple of years in, in the White House. And Carter, um, he came from nowhere. It still was the most rapid rise in American political history. His name recognition was less than 1% a year before he was sworn in. Um, and, and so he was, um, his base was, he, he had, there were sort of three elements of his base, apart from it being post Watergate and Gerald Ford having pardoned Richard Nixon. One was he worked kind of the, um, the editorial board circuit and all the people in the big cities who heard him thought, this guy is really impressive. It was sort of a Mayor Pete phenomenon before his time, but somebody who was a peanut farmer and was, was had been governor of Georgia. 
Um, second was was um, you know the, the religious base. He, he was a born again Christian. He talked about that very freely, and this was a major part. He he was was and is a real believer. You know, is he's still alive at more, more than than a hundred? Um, and so he lots of events were in churches where he would talk with great knowledge about the gospel and the, the lessons that were most important to him and his what faith meant to him. And then there was the South itself. Jimmy Carter carried all of the old Confederacy except Virginia. You know, the last uh, Democrat, Bill Clinton carried some of it, but Carter, that was his base, was, was, was the South. And this was before Nixon's Southern strategy, Southern strategy began to kick in as, as it did um, in, in, really in, in the, uh, the the Reagan times. And so there was a time, I remember a rally about a month before the election in Reading, Pennsylvania. Crucially, the 1976 race was the first one against um, after Roe v. Wade. So it was the first time that this was a, a national issue, much as this current election was the first one after Dobbs. And we went into this, you know, some schoolhouse or something or union hall in Reading, Pennsylvania, and it was surrounded by anti-abortion protesters, um, you know, who were mobilized from the local church. And from that point on in the campaign, uh, the, the anti-abortion troops, you know, were, were mobilized to come and sort of to protest all the events. And I can't remember exactly who it was. It wasn't Falwell, but somebody else was saying they recognized then this was going to be the new wedge issue for them. The, yeah. the, 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 this was, you know, and so that was I saw it first in Reading, Pennsylvania. It was a, a feature of the rest of Carter's time in office. And Carter was not a big abortion fan, as you know. He and Gerald Ford were more or less on the same uh, side of saying, we don't like abortion, but Roe v. Wade is the way we can, you know, we can work together, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, that, that became a, a factor. It wasn't what beat him, I think, in 1980. It was terrible economy. It was the Iranian hostages, et, et cetera. But, yes, I remember. I'll always remember that. Well, and I mean that that wave lapped our shores last night. I mean that that is that 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 has fueled generations of evangelical active, you know, political yep. activism. Um, we had a comment in or a question earlier in the chat from Bryce asking about like the, you know, the connection between um, political evangelicalism and what we're seeing now, and like that that's it. That was the inception of this wave that has continued and just has continued to grow. I mean, both Paul and I grew up in the evangelical church, Paul charismatic, me not so much, but basically the same difference was, you know, they were speaking in tongues and we were not, they were raising their hands. We were not, but like it was the same kind of church. And, um, and you were going I mean, to hell and we were not. Oh, that's true. No. <laughs> well, actually you thought you could go to hell if you accidentally said the wrong word on it. You know, I, I yeah. at least was like once saved, always saved. So like yeah, I, saved true, the, I said the prayer when I was four and you were I going to hell the because rest of my of life. Your once saved, always saved beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it, 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 like all this stuff is ingrained and yeah. rooted deeply in, in faith traditions, like across the country. And it was, as you all know better than I, it was intentionally weaponized, you know, yes. starting from the Carter era onward. And, you know, you would not find a more, you would not find two less likely standard bearers for pure Christianity than Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. And yet yes. this is a, a crucial part. I mean, especially Trump. Reagan, Reagan may have been to church at some point in his life. I don't think Trump would be struck by a lightning bolt if he came, came into a church. Um, but but it's it has been weaponized very shrewdly as, as what they can do, along with guns, along with anti-immigrant uh, fervor now. I, I saw a comment a minute ago about somebody wanting more stories. I'll give a very brief one that's not on this topic, but it shows you the glamour of being a speechwriter. So with my uh, glorious $500 a month salary, we're going to the Atlanta headquarters uh, for the Carter campaign in early 1976. I got my first speechwriting assignment which was to draft a bylined article for Jimmy Carter in the NRA magazine called My First Kill. <laughs> it was about he how he shot some possum. <laughs> so I had to go say, well, Governor, can you tell me about shooting this possum? So he told oh me. My and I, God. So that, that's that's the glamour of the speech writing life. <laughs> oh, my God. That is that. Do you still have it, by the way? You need uh, that for the archives, it is, Jim. It's someplace in the boxes in the attic, which Deb is always rolling her eyes at me to get. Um, I think I'm supposed to give those to some university at some point. 
I, <laughs> by the way, Jimmy Carter is amazing and saying he wanted to live to vote for mm -hmm. uh, VP Harris. And yeah. I mean, I remember I, how many years ago was it? He went into hospice and I remember telling Ashley, ago, yeah. like, like, oh, Jimmy Carter's going to die. That's terrible. And, and uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember his wife's name. She passed away oh, before Rosalind, he yeah. did. Yeah. Yep. Right. Rosalind did. Wow. And just to, uh, so this weekend, I'm actually going to be in Dayton, Ohio, where uh, at an event where Jimmy Carter is getting a big, you know, the Dayton Literary oh. Peace Prize or something. And I'm going to be doing a Q&A with his grandson, Jason, oh, about wow. you know, Jimmy precious. Carter's legacy. So that is precious. Wow. <sighs> but um, that's that's to to Bryce's question that he asked in our feed here on, on the live stream. That's all it takes is for a candidate to say. Yes, I'm a Christian, and a, a, and show none of the characteristics of a yeah. Christian. Like you say, the irony is, in 12 years as president, neither Reagan or Trump ever darkened the door of a church. Yeah. Bill Clinton went to church. Bill and Hillary went to church when they were in the White House, you know. But um, and and then say I'm anti-abortion, which yeah. I'm pretty sure Trump has paid for. Yes. More than one in his life. That, but Christians are like, that's all that matters to me. Just say you're a Christian and anti-abortion and and you're my guy, you know, and it's it's really for us uh, a tragedy of a, a a politicization of our religion that that is really sickening to the core. So so I'll ask you what will burn that out mm. uh, I, I'm, I'm in the evangelical side? Okay, this is literally Paul and I, I mean, this is like, like <laughs> this a is decade where we, or more. This is where we like, part uh, ways. Uh, well, I don't know about that. I was going to say uh, this is a decade or more of us just being like, uh, oh, okay. what? Like, kind of like, wait, ho now, ho 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 hold on, ho hold on, hold on. Like, this isn't anything like Jesus. Like, are we all reading the same book? I mean, it's, it is... It, it, I've been feeling like I've, I've hyperventilated for like 12 years now, consistent hyperventilating. Like, I cannot believe this. It, it, it So what's it going to take? I mean, this is where Paul and I do part ways a little bit because, you know, Paul, your perspective is like, it's just going to be a really like crash and burn. We're going to have to experience all the consequences of this sort of thing for there to be a heart turn. Um, and I guess I would say I'm aware that that might be what's needed. I, I sure as heck hope. I, I think I, I'm hopeful that human beings can find each other again in a different way, you know, like that it doesn't have to come to calamity. So we do have a little different I, uh, perspective there. I, I believe I have the Bible and history sadly behind <laughs> me. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Jesus saw his religion in the first century, at least the story we read, had had also been politicized. And I, I often say he saw a group of men saying, we need to make Israel great again. And, you know, we need our religion and uh, to be in charge of the country so God's plan can be existent on earth. And, and that is exactly who Mike Johnson is. You know, that's that we need our brand of Christianity to be in charge of the country and then America will be great again and God's plan will exist on earth. And, and with the information ecosystem being so controlled by Republican propaganda and all of these things, I, I am not sure what else can fix it. But, you know, what we see in Jeremiah in the Hebrew Torah saying, nope, uh, we're not going to be okay. Babylon is going to take us, and that's God's mercy to get our attention back to the fact that we have to take care of the poor, the foreigner, the marginalized, and the economically disadvantaged. And and Jesus pointed at the temple and said, "Not one stone of that thing's going to stand on top of another." And and so I was sort of leaning towards maybe we're we can be redeemed, but a after last night, I'm a little bit in like. No, we, this is our choice that we've we've chosen the king that we want and and we we will have to face the consequences of that and maybe that's what it's going to take to get our generational attention to turn back to something of of goodness again I, I know that you all have devoted much of your lives to plumbing these issues and living these issues so i I, I respect what you say I, I have a whole different um you know, 
Deb and I have a whole different faith journey we can tell you about in another time. Uh, now I'll just ask you, are there are there any statistics about how the evangelical vote went yesterday? Whether Was it any more for Trump than it had been before? Is there any change or just a constant? It's a good question. I haven't seen anything yet. Have you, Paul? I haven't, but I, I can't imagine. I mean, what, what was it, 81% in 2020? So I, I can't imagine that it's anything anything less than that, you know. Um, I, I was telling a statistic that uh, I think in 76, Carter got like 49% of the evangelical vote, and that was like this huge number. Yeah. And then Reagan got 67% in 80, and then, you know, to, down to Trump in 2020 got 81%. Um, so it's it has coalesced into this huge voting block. So I would assume we're going to be somewhere there or north of there uh, from yesterday. So I know, Jim, it's East Coast time where you are. You've been so gracious to be with us tonight. Um, I wonder if uh, you have time for one more question and then we'll let you we'll let you go and we'll have a little more um, processing time with uh, Paul and me. Um, so you started off by saying you were going to share your brain version first. And I'm wondering, like, well, tell us about that heart view, or yeah. did you already kind of go over that so, too? So the, the heart view is, this is, again, I, I studied American history in college. I've, you know, the sort of the running subject of every article I've ever written, every book I've ever written essentially is, is America going to make it? Because the story of America is continuing to get in trouble and then getting out of trouble. And just, yeah. uh, and this is, as this is again the worst blow uh, that that I have can remember, and having been around, you know, when George Wallace carried five states, and when, uh, you know, that when it, it's it is a a very troubling time, and, and in practical terms, um, I, I I can send you to share with your audience a non paid wall link paywall link to a new article I have in Wired about why your California, my California, from San Bernardino County, is going to be the laboratory of democracy yeah. for the foreseeable future. And that people yeah. need to take that seriously, that there's responsibility to work, you know, to participate um, nationally and also in your community. But the state has a very important role. And wow. where one American of every eight uh, lives there, one dollar of every seven in the U.S. GDP comes from there. And California, which has a bad image right now, actually, yep. I think is going to be a place where a lot of good things can happen. You know, and when you when you published that, Jim, I think it was last week, like now it met like you did. Maybe you had an idea when you were writing it, like how important that insight was. But now, like, oh, my gosh, a week later, even more so. Well, well, thank you. And then the Wired people very properly had me, you know, sort of hedge it. You know, whether we have the first um, whether we have a California born president, you know, the first Democrat from California, she would she would be or whether California is going to be the reinvention state, you know, more, more than the resistance state. Either way, what's happening yes. there is important. So I will That's send it. you all in just a minute. Again, a non paywall link to to share with your <laughs> California and elsewhere um, list, viewers and, and listeners. That's so awesome. you don't so you don't think uh, we're going to carve ourselves out with Oregon and Washington and say, hey, uh, We'll go out on our own here and see what happens. They can be part of the informal uh, force field. <laughs> you know, I uh, just I appreciate Moss's comment here uh, in the live stream that we have hope in California. I do think that's the way we have to look at it. I also, for the Californians on that are listening, we also have to be serious. Like we are not playing around. Our state is not working right now. Yeah. It has to work. Yeah. Yep. It absolutely yep. has to work. And it is now not just for the 40 million people who live here, but it is it is the American democratic experiment right now. The ideals, the values are there. The execution is not. We have to be honest about that. We have to freaking govern ourselves and care about implementation and execution and not just like words that come out of mouths. Like we have to do the work. So anyway, but uh, but I mean, I'm up for that. I, I agree entirely because it really matters how California comports itself, and and from the heart, you know on the about the heart, Deb and I are most likely going to be spending most of our time in California for, for the foreseeable future, just because it's DC bears the stamp of whoever is in charge here. Uh, just that's in, it. Uh, in I mean, and I and I oh, go ahead, Ashley. 
Well, I'll see uh, I'll see Jim next week in DC. We're yeah. we serve on a board together, and um, that I, I will go on that trip. And um, I, I likely won't. I mean, I I didn't visit the four years that Trump was president before. Not one. And it it trip. seems like we need to get away from Democrat Republican in California to like. Uh, I, I don't know how to, you know, reasonable people versus, you know, the cracky people and, and, and the reasonable pe people forget about Democrat, Republican, and just like, how do we s solve things? And I don't know, Jim, I, I, and I know Ashley said last question, but in the kind of what we call the deconstruction community here, I don't know if you've heard that term, but a lot of people who are leaving faith are, are deconstructing their spirituality. Uh, we've had some talks in the network of these uh, of these channels of are we going to need to find ways to help women move around the country to get health care or, you know, protect people who the government's coming after? I, I mean, could you foresee something like that to be needed in the in the near future? Yes. And I think already with women, you know, these women every day we hear a story of a woman dying mainly in the South. And, and uh, one of my sons with his family lives in Texas and, you know, that, that's happening all the time there. So and you recall that very early in his first time and around Donald Trump had this sweeping anti-Muslim order or something like that. And citizens and people in New Jersey and New York showed up basically to block, you know, the, 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 the airports to keep th those kind of raids from from happening. And so I think, yes, practical help for people who are victims of new policies. That is a very important thing to do. And if, and if they start trying mass deportations, I think we may need to do the same and, yes. and stand up and help. I, I, I mean, I, I, still, I still have some hope that if we start seeing people dragged out of their homes and put into white vans to be taken to some country they've never been to before, that that's going to hit us and we're going to say, no, this is not OK. This is not America. I, I, I don't know. I'm holding out some hope for that. And in very crass terms, um, we spent a lot of time in sort of the farm areas of the Midwest. Half their workforce is immigrants. You know, they're, yeah. they're, they're going to yeah. be no farms anymore, especially yeah. dairy farms, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> All right. Jim, All right. thank you On that so note. much. <laughs> I know. Well, uh, give our best to Deb and um, thank you for being thank with you. us. And thank Thanks you for everybody for, joining for what in. And what it matters, we all continue the work we start tonight and tomorrow. So thank you for giving me this chance. What a joy to talk to you. Thank you, Jim. See you all. Bye. Okay. And, and for everybody else, we'll hang around a bit and keep processing. And uh, yeah, Jim, we'll talk to you soon. Um, I guess you know what's inspiring about that a little too is is these are, are and and Stephanie is saying uh, she does not have that hope that Americans will be mortified uh, by those pictures. I I made a video of of some pictures of 1959. We saw this uh, in Chavez Ravine when the Brooklyn Dodgers were moving to California. Literally, uh, Hispanic laborers were were dragged out of their homes, uh, police holding a woman by each hand and each foot, dragging her down the stairs so that their homes could be bulldozed for the Dodgers stadium to be built. Um, and I just, if, if, if they're going to try to take 11 million or as Trump changes the number every day to 21, 22 million people and, and send them out of the country, I, I just really how would uh, how would Americans do that? And and yes, it would cost billions and billions to do it. But uh, what I was going to say, Ashley, you know, it, it is maybe in times like this that we we find out who we are, and and maybe that could yeah. be part of the blessing of the moment. Yeah. Huh. So, um, I think it would be good to just like spend a few minutes just kind of like allowing people who are listening you and me I mean this like like I've been looking forward to this time because I'm like this is this is my healing moment for the day so um yeah I think um I don't know I think I so I I I have ended the day 
imagining, I have this, I have like this sort of mental image in my mind. And that is that every human being, I believe, and this was embedded in me from my Christian tradition. I believe every human being has like their, their spiritual part of them, their eternal part, their part that connects with, I do believe in a divine, you know, outside of a human experience. And I think every person has the, has the ability to connect and is connected to the divine and carries that in them. And what I've learned after the last three years of pretty intense therapy for, you know, all the things that you and I are walking through together, my own healing journey, all the stuff I've needed to work through um, is I, I think I've learned the power of that light that's in people and the fact that there's nothing I can do. Like I've, I've mostly just carried an agenda my whole life of like trying to convince somebody to think the way I think. And sometimes powers of persuasion are effective at whatever, but like in terms of deep heart attitude issues, people have to choose, they have to choose their own way. And so I've just been imagining, I saw, you know, the picture last night of um, the Palm Beach Convention Center and all the red hats, everyone waiting for Donald Trump to come out. I'm just imagining every one of those people, they have that, they have that spiritual component in them. And like, just imagine that they're in some way they choose to see things a certain way, like they choose to flip the switch and choose to engage with people. You know, I don't, I know I'm just imagining like people do still have the ability to change their hearts and minds. It's just, they have to do it on their own. Like we can't, we can't make them. And I think that's a lot of kind of what this sort of MAGA movement is about is feeling like there's been this, um, you know, sort of judgment or criticism or like, you know, pushing them to think a certain way. And it's like this great big reaction to that. But like, what if people choose it on their own? You know, do you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, yeah, I, I, and I, I let you hold that. And yeah. I worry again about the ecosystem. I don't know how they get out of it if they're inside an echo chamber that never gives them anything other than information that feeds the narrative. Um, I do want to acknowledge we have some folks that are that are in on uh, Instagram and uh, I miss I lost the name of the person who made somebody asked and I'm sorry I lost the name. Somebody was asking. Oh, here it is. Um, sorry, Ronald, uh, Ronald was asking thoughts on LGBT concerns in, in the future. And, you know, certainly one of uh, my fears today of, is that the rhetoric of Trump, you know, gives permission to people to, to be their worst self and, you know, what does that mean for queer people? And how, you know, how do people come out of sort of this mass hypnosis of, yeah, we hate trans people. They're, they're coming after our kids, you know, all of the things they're being told on right-wing media every day. And if, and so in some ways there's there's got to be a break in that ecosystem right for that to happen and that's that's why i think sometimes it does take calamity for us to start to focus on what matters you know well, and, yeah okay but also um i mean we do a fair amount of work in this space of like you know bridging different community groups and dealing with you know systemic barriers that different people groups with a racial, ethnic, um, gender, sexual orientation, like we, like there's a lot of, so there's a lot of research around what actually changes people's minds or doesn't. And all the research validates it is one-on-one -on -one connection. It's, it's, you know, you like, connecting with someone who has a, it's, it's why there are these major initiatives like StoryCorps where, 
you get people from different walks of life to just sit down and record, like share their life story with another person. And that gets recorded and they get shared out. Um, so the ecosystem breaking, like it, it's actually probably more likely that it, a different person crosses their path and maybe at work or family, you know, some, something and their in relationship is fostered. And then in that, like people just start to, to, you know, find their way a bit differently. You know, I don't know that it has to be some massive ecosystem shift, although that would be nice. I, I just, I think what we have to be careful of is, and, and I'm, I'm new in this space a little bit, so it's, it's really not mine to hold and own. Um, but I think there are people who understandably are saying, Hey, we've been fighting this fight since the eighties. And yesterday was an indication that we haven't come nearly as far as we thought we had. Um, so anyway, I just, I, I think it's, we just have to be careful not to yeah. invalidate that. I, I, I think there are, are queer people today who are like, I thought we were much farther along and, and BIPOC right. people and, and such who are like, how can this be? We're it's it's 2024. It's not nine. It's not 1978. Yep. Well, anymore, I, you know? I think that's a well, that one of the layers of sort of intense stuff for me is shock. Is is this total stunned? Like what in the actual bleep? Like are what is this? For in 2016, to be honest, I, I knew Trump was going to win. Okay. You did. I did. I knew he was going to win. Oh I was not gosh, shocked I had by it. No idea. I was totally stunned. No, I was. I was not shocked, but I really did not expect this. So, um, yeah. So that's part of it is just like, it's like being like stun gunned. Um, I, I, you know, I, I do believe. There were a lot of people who voted their pocketbook. I, I and I think Jim echoed that. But I, but you either had to be, it, and somebody wrote a pretty long dissertation on Instagram of, of you have to be pretty unknowledgeable about economics to have made that choice. Um, but and again, the ecosystem thing comes into play there. But you you also have to make a choice of like. On one level, it's like, uh, I'll take the rapist as long as the price of my eggs come down or to be very crass. And I'm sorry about that. I, or it's as, as I was hearing on one podcast today, I, I think the ecosystem coming off of COVID probably is we, you know, Americans are like, we don't trust anything the Democrats say anymore because We've been told over and over again, they lied about the pandemic. They lied about shutting down the businesses and the schools and, and all of these things. And so as Harris was doing a very, very good campaign in very difficult circumstances, they were just like, yeah, you're telling us the economy's getting better, but we don't believe you. And, yeah. and so that's a, that's a very difficult position that we're in as a country right now. Yeah. Well, and like, you know, things are still expensive. Like, yeah. so, you know, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, that's what you're thinking about. Yeah. Um, I just, I do wonder, I, I mean, like I said, I do think Trump's going to, he'll come in and, and, you know, I saw gas at 395 today and, and he'll get credit for that, you know? Yeah. Um, and, but if he starts throwing tariffs on a lot of things, prices are going to start jacking up again real quick. And, and that may, yeah. that may pretend poorly. So, yeah. Well, we have some people commenting. You want to like interact with some of these? Uh, I'm, I'm so frozen. I'm so stuck. Okay. Like, I feel like 
people who are um, listening to this on audio, um, maybe a few days from now, they're like, what you're going to hear from me is just, I feel like a kind of blubbering idiot right now. Like I am really lost. I'm really, really lost. I'm exhausted. There are a lot of layers to work through. I'm trying to not like my natural tendency is to try to fix it and make it okay for people. And I know that fixer Ashley doesn't need, like, there's nothing I can do, you know, but I'm trying to make it okay for you. I'm trying to make it okay for our kids. I'm trying to make it, you know, and, and it's like, there's no, there's, there's, we just can't, we can't rush in and try to make things better. Um, and then I'm also thinking ahead of like, Oh, if there is a path, if there is a bridge to be built, um, how do you do that? And how do you lay the groundwork now for that? Um, Cause I really do fear what happens if we're not able to build a bridge with people. I'm, I think for the queer community, uh, you know, I've, I'm inspired. You, you watched the movie milk the other night and yep. Uh, I watched, or we both listened to the, the podcast series of, uh, G uh gays versus Briggs or Briggs yep, versus slow burn. Gays. It's amazing. Slow burn. Um, yep. and Harvey Milk saying, if you're gay, come out, you know, yep. it, it, it's, it's a hard thing to say, but you know, stand up and show, you know, or, or show out because people need to know that they have to know you if they, they know, know you. Yeah. They have to know that they know, like you're saying, one on one, you know, let them know that a that that police officer they know, that teacher they know, that pastor they know, that you name it, they know is queer and is okay, is a good person. And I think this that that may be a clarion call again. Like you've you've been hidden and we respect that and we understand it, but now yep. may not be the time if if you can without putting yourself in grave danger, you know, step up and step out and find somebody who will stand by you as you do it. Because, um, you know, we may need uh, some help in those spaces. And so Pucky is saying, you know, if you do start an underground thing, helping women and others, let me know. I want to help. I live in mostly blue Minnesota. I'm going to try to connect with other like-minded people and see what we can do. And so this, this may be our, our fixing thing for a while. It's like, how can we, we stand with people who might be a little bit in jeopardy if things go poorly as, as we look at what's coming ahead. Charlie says, I'm terrified. So I can only imagine how it is for my trans bros and sis as I'm in Texas there was a pastor that went to city council meeting saying that the LGBT plus community needed to be put to death. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think maybe, you know, let, let's give up the weight of, of fixing things today. It's, it is a day of grieving and lament, I think. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm sure that my shocked, stunned silence is not a particularly good listen for people. <laughs> I was really imagining that I could like work through some things by being on the show tonight and talking with you and seeing comments from other people. And I think, I think I'm like, you I'm like a sparking robot, like slowly. Well, um, Doug on the left to, to bring a, a different, to, is asking why you have pronouns on yours and I do not. Well, I know why, why I have my pronouns. I don't know why you do not, other than you have your long um, social media handle there. So maybe you just didn't want to take up any more room. Yeah, uh, you, I assume this is your professional zoom handle and and you're in the spaces where people put their pronouns on on their yeah. name right i guess so. although i probably typed that at some point specifically yeah. for the platform that um we do this podcast on yeah. um anyway 
And, so, mine, and you're exactly right on mine. It's just, it would just keep going. It would just be going. very long. I've got my social media handles and it would just be really long yeah. to add my, yeah. I, at some point, people's eyes just go to a blur when something yeah. is, is too long there. So that's why um, I, did, I did it that way. Well, listen, I, I appreciate Rebecca, your comment about us holding space. That is definitely what we um, were hoping to do and what we always do love doing. Um, I would just say like, you know, we like, thank you, Charlie. Thank you so much for connecting with us here. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you sign up for the evangelical ish newsletter, unconventional pastor Paul, uh, you can go to our website, evangelical ish.com and just sign up. It's free. And then, um, we will be able to stay in close touch. I think we're thinking about maybe we should do a zoom for anybody who needs more time and space, um, maybe sometime over the weekend. So let's just all stay in touch. And again, make sure you're on our list. So you are you know, get the emails and you can always do, um, direct message, Paul. Um, he loves to interact with folks and you, you all are inspiring to us. So yeah, let's stay there for each other. And, um, yep. Holding yep. You all and, uh, as Sherry is mentioning, we do have a private Facebook group for evangelical ish. So you can join us over there. And a lot of people, uh, carry each other's burdens there. I, as I wrote in the newsletter today, uh, the word for Holy Spirit in the New Testament is paraclete. And what paraclete literally means is one who walks alongside. And I believe we are to be paracletes to each other and carry each other's burdens as we walk alongside. And so let's do that in this season together. <laughs>